Hello Year 12 and welcome to the second lesson in our new topic. Uh, today we are going to look at how the Bolsheviks set up their new government in November of 1917. So I'd like you to get yourself set up for the lesson. Uh, if you can find somewhere quiet where you can work, you'll need to download the worksheets that I sent you and you'll need a pen and some A4 paper. You might also need uh, the notes which we took last time. Uh, and if you can, um, can you put away any distractions like phones and things like that so that you can really focus on what we're going to do. Uh, pause now and when you're ready, hit play. So we're going to start today by recalling some of the uh, material from last lesson. Uh, we were looking at the ideology of Lenin and the Bolshevik party. So you have five recall questions to have a go at here, all short answers. Um, but I'd like you to pause the video now and have a go at doing them for yourself uh, without looking back at your notes and without looking at your knowledge organisers. Um, and when you're done, if you hit play, I'll show you the answers. So here are those answers and I'd like you to mark your own work. Uh, don't panic if you got one of them wrong, but uh, I do want you to correct your answers, preferably in a different colour pen. And don't forget to uh, add up your score and give yourself a mark out of five at the end. Now, the next thing we're going to do is update our knowledge organisers. So you'll need your copy, which you began last time. And I'm going to show you the areas where we'll be working in this lesson. Here they are. Um, now you will need to pause the video in a moment and update your knowledge organiser, um, highlighting the uh, areas of content that we're going to focus on today. Before you do that, um, I just want to uh, identify a couple of key areas and key points on here to watch out for. In today's lesson, we're mostly going to be looking at what the Bolsheviks did in the early months of their time um, in power. And as we do this, we will start to understand one of the reasons why the Bolsheviks managed to survive as a government. We'll be looking at some of the pragmatic decisions they made and how flexible they could be um, in adapting their uh, ideology and adapting their principles in order to hold on to power. So watch out for that as we go through the lesson. Pause now, highlight your knowledge organiser. When you're done, hit play and we'll move forward. So in today's lesson, uh, we'll look at how the Bolsheviks set up their new government. I'd like you to understand how they did this. And I want you also to understand the importance of the Bolsheviks early decrees uh, in their first couple of months in charge. And we're also going to identify some evidence that the Bolsheviks were starting to build a dictatorship even before the civil war began. Let's look a little closer at the immediate problems and threats which the Bolsheviks faced when they first took power at the end of October 1917. Now, you don't need to make notes on this here and now, um, but you will be doing a task uh, based on it a little later. So the first big challenge for the Bolsheviks was setting up a new government. Now, remember, the Bolsheviks were revolutionaries. They had no experience of government and they hadn't really made any detailed plans for what they would do after seizing power. Lenin had promised to rule through the Soviet, but there were many non-Bolsheviks in the Soviet, including Mensheviks and SRs. So ruling through the Soviet 
would require the Bolsheviks to work with and compromise with these other parties. And part of Lenin's ideology was that he was opposed to coalition with other parties. Government ministries, civil servants and the state bank were refusing at this point to work with the Bolsheviks. They had gone on strike. And although the Bolsheviks took power in Moscow after 10 days fighting, outside of Petrograd and Moscow, the Bolsheviks had almost no control of the country whatsoever. Local committees and local Soviets were running their own affairs. They were not under Bolshevik control. The Bolsheviks also faced widespread opposition to their rule from powerful groups within Russian society. And these groups didn't expect the Bolsheviks to last for very long as a government. The Bolsheviks also faced pressure from other socialist parties like the Mensheviks and the SRs. These socialist parties disapproved of the Bolshevik takeover. They did not feel that the time was right for a socialist revolution in Russia. And Lenin was also under pressure from both inside and outside his own party to reach some kind of compromise with the other socialist parties and to form a coalition with them. Even leading Bolsheviks like Kamenev and Zinoviev warned Lenin that he must form a coalition with other socialist parties. Otherwise, he would have to rule by force and coercion. Another serious challenge facing the Bolsheviks was the running of industry. Now the problems in this area stemmed from the upheaval of the war effort which had a devastating impact on the Russian economy. Russian industries were suffering shortages of raw materials and therefore production was dropping. Factories were closing down and that was resulting in high inflation and rising unemployment. It also resulted in increasing antagonism between workers and their bosses, with workers demanding better conditions. And in many factories, workers had already begun to form factory committees and were even taking control of their factories, forcing the management out. In the countryside, the Bolsheviks faced the question of land ownership. Now, peasant hopes were incredibly high. They wanted immediate land reform. In fact, since the summer of 1917, peasant committees had already begun to take the matter into their own hands, seizing the land from the nobles and dividing it up among the peasant households. And they expected the Bolshevik government to approve, authorise this takeover of the land. Lastly, the Bolsheviks faced the problem of how to deliver on their promise to end the war. Now, the war was highly unpopular and it was causing economic collapse in Russia. And the Bolsheviks had promised to end the war immediately but the fact that the Russian army was disintegrating put the Bolsheviks in a very weak negotiating position with the Germans. And in fact, the Bolshevik party itself was split over whether to sign a separate peace with Germany. Some Bolsheviks saw the war as an opportunity to try and spread or export the revolution to Germany. So they wanted to carry on fighting. And now you're ready for your starter task. I want you to try to put yourself into Lenin's shoes um, in the first months after the October Revolution. You have a little table with some of the key issues facing Lenin in this period. And what I'd like you to do 
is choose which of the two alternatives do you think Lenin will choose in each area? And I'd like you to record your predictions. You will need to pause now to do that. And when you're finished, hit play and we'll move forward. Next, let's look at the new government which Lenin set up. Now, against the expectations of workers, soldiers and peasants, Lenin chose not to make the Soviet the main body of government. The reason for this is that the Soviet contained many non-Bolsheviks and Lenin was unwilling to discuss or compromise on his policies with those other parties. So Lenin set up an entirely new body called the Sovnarkom. This was going to be the new government. It was effectively a council of ministers, although the Bolsheviks didn't use the word ministers. That was associated with the old provisional government. So this was a council of commissars. There were about 30 to 40 of them, each holding a different position. And initially, all of them were Bolsheviks. Now you can see the faces of some of them here. And although we don't need to know all of them by name, there are a few that I'm going to point out to you. There's Lenin, who was the chairman of the Sovnikom. Here's Trotsky, who was commissar for foreign affairs, and he was also commissar for war. There's Stalin, he became the commissar for nationalities. And another name which we might hear a little bit more of in future is this one here, Rykov, who became the commissar for internal affairs. Now, each of these commissars was head of a commissariat, a department with a staff of civil servants or bureaucrats who were unelected, um, appointed to carry out the day to day business in that particular area. The Soviet, meanwhile, became increasingly irrelevant. It met less and less frequently. Real power lay with the Sovnarkom, which usually met once or twice a day to take decisions and govern the country. Note here, we already have an early sign that the Bolsheviks intended to dominate government and that they had no intention of sharing power with other parties right from the earliest days of Bolshevik rule. Now, another key figure for the Bolsheviks at this point was this man, Yakov Sverdlov. He was an incredibly loyal and devoted ally of Lenin and an exceptional organiser. While the Bolsheviks had been an underground party, it was said that Sverdlov could literally remember the details of every single Bolshevik who was in exile. He'd committed them to memory. And Lenin made him the chairman of the Secretariat. Now, the Secretariat, in theory, had no power of its own. Its role was to administer or organise the party and the central committee. So, for example, the secretariat gathered and supplied information to the party. It organised meetings, took minutes of those meetings and it kept membership files. So kind of all the organisational paperwork which needs to be done in order to run the party smoothly. Now, from 1917 onwards, Sverdlov began to appoint a network of party officials or bureaucrats across Russia and he began to set up local secretariats in every region to organise the local branches of the Bolshevik party and to report back to the central party in Moscow. And here we can see 
that even in the party's early days, the Bolsheviks had begun to develop what we would call a bureaucracy. Unelected, appointed officials, paid and employed by the party to carry out its orders. So in the first two months of Bolshevik rule, the Sovnarkom passes a series of decrees which help the Bolshevik government to survive. We're going to look at a few of the most important ones. And as we do, I'd like you to try and keep the following in mind. Firstly, at this stage, the Bolsheviks had no power to impose their will on the people. Much of the country was outside Bolshevik control. So largely, the Bolsheviks go along with what the people are already doing. Secondly, the Bolsheviks try to win support by giving the people what they wanted. And thirdly, that meant that in some key areas, the Bolsheviks compromised on their principles. In other words, the Bolsheviks were quite flexible or pragmatic. They were willing to prioritise hanging on to power above their beliefs. And you'll see that in a moment. So one of the first decrees passed by the Sovnarkom is the decree on peace. This was a plea to all the other countries who were involved in fighting World War I. A plea for a ceasefire and a fair peace, or as they put it, a peace with no annexations and no indemnities. In other words, they wanted an end to the war without having to give up any land and without having to pay any reparations. Now, the importance of this decree is not that it had any significant impact on the war itself, because the other fighting nations just ignore it and they go on fighting regardless. And the Germans continue to attack Russia. But this decree did earn the Bolsheviks support from workers and soldiers who were keen to see an end to this war as soon as possible. Another important decree issued by the Sovnikom is the land decree. This gave peasants permission to seize the estates of the nobility and to divide it up amongst themselves so that each peasant household received a share of the land for its own private property. Now, this doesn't really have a great impact on the course of events in the countryside. The peasants were already seizing the land for themselves anyway. So the Bolsheviks really didn't have any alternative here. It was already happening. And whether or not the Bolsheviks gave permission, the peasants were going to seize the land anyway. So it doesn't really change the course of events in the countryside as such. But it does earn the Bolsheviks support from the peasantry because it legitimised their actions. It gave them permission to take the land which they wanted. And that earned the Bolsheviks goodwill from the peasantry. Another key thing worth noting here is that in order to deliver this uh, promise to the peasants, the Bolsheviks are having to compromise one of their key principles. As Marxists, they fundamentally disagreed with the idea of private land ownership, the idea that peasants should own their own private property. That was against Bolshevik principles altogether, but the Bolsheviks are willing to compromise on that principle in order to win support from the peasants at this stage. Over the long term, Lenin and the Bolsheviks have no intention 
of allowing the peasants to keep this land permanently. But for short term political gain, they are willing to allow the peasants to take that land for themselves. The Sovnikom also issued the Decree on Workers' Control. This allowed workers' committees in the factories to control production and to control finances and to supervise their managers, the factory owners. Now, again, this was incredibly popular with the workers who wanted greater power over how their factories were run. And indeed, many workers had already formed factory committees and begun to do this anyway. So the Bolsheviks, once again, are going along with what is already happening because they don't have the power to impose their will on the workers. What Lenin hoped to achieve at this point was a period of what he called state capitalism. This would be a type of economy in which the state would control industry, but the existing middle class managers would continue to run industry. Lenin felt that in this period of dictatorship of the proletariat, the Bolsheviks would need the existing factory managers who were experts to go on running the factories. However, some workers went further and rather than just supervising their managers, these workers committees began seizing control of the factories completely and removing their uh, middle class managers. And this went far beyond what the Bolsheviks wanted. So the Bolsheviks were deeply unhappy about this. But at this point, they were unable to stop it happening. The Sovnikom also issues the Rights of the People of Russia decree. This gave national minorities living in the different parts of the Russian Empire the right of self-determination. In other words, the right to choose their own government, which effectively meant that if they wanted to, they could break away from the Russian Empire and form their own independent countries. Now, this decree is less important than it sounds, because, as we know, the Bolsheviks had no control over these areas of the country anyway. So they were unable to stop these national minorities breaking away from the empire if they chose to. So once again, we have the Bolsheviks going along with what is already happening. We also have another example here of the Bolsheviks compromising on some of their principles, because in the long term, the Bolsheviks have no intention of letting these areas of the empire break away. But for short term political gain, they issue this decree. The Sovnikom also set up a new body to take control of industry. It was called Vysenka, or the Supreme Economic Council. Now, this was a government body which would take charge of all industry and plan the economy. And that was part of Lenin's strategy of state capitalism. Now, on paper, Vysenka was going to take control of all industry, but at first, its control was limited. However, it did quickly take control of banks and railways. We would say it nationalised banks and railways, brought them under state control. And it also cancelled all of Russia's foreign debts. In other words, the Bolshevik government refused to repay any of the money which it, hit, which it had been loaned by Western countries, including all the war credits which France and Britain had loaned to the provisional government and the Tsar's government before. Defaulting on these debts, refusing to pay them, created tension between the new Bolshevik government 
and Western countries. The Sovnikom also issued a decree abolishing formal titles in Russian society so that everybody referred to each other by the title comrade, no matter what rank or position in society you had previously held. And the Sovnikom also issued a decree on army democratisation. This introduced the principle that officers in the army should be elected by their men and that soldiers committees and soldiers soviets should take charge of the army. It also ended army ranks and got rid of saluting in the army. Now these things fitted in very well with Bolshevik principles of creating a more um, equal society and breaking down the social hierarchy. And both measures won a great deal of support for the new Bolshevik government from workers and soldiers. However, the decree on army democratisation accelerated the breakdown of army discipline, which had already gathered pace through 1917. So now it's time for your main task. Um, I'd like you to read pages 117 to 118 in your textbook. And using that information and the information in this tutorial video, I want you to complete the first three rows, please, on your worksheet today, um, where you're looking at the problems which Lenin faced and how Lenin solved them. So you're gonna do number one, number two, and number three. For each one, I want you to describe the problem the Bolsheviks faced, and I want you to put some bullet point notes here on how Lenin dealt with it. I also want you to score Lenin in each area. How effectively did he solve that problem? When you're done on that, you might also return to the predictions which you made at the start of the lesson, and particularly predictions A, C, F, J, K, L, and M. How accurate were your predictions? Did you get them right? Before we finish today's lesson, I want us to return to one of our big questions of this unit. Why did the Bolsheviks become dictators? And hopefully you remember we made this diagram showing some of the features of the Bolshevik dictatorship. We have two possible hypotheses we're considering as answers to this question. Hypothesis one is the idea that the Bolsheviks always intended to create a dictatorship. Hypothesis two is that the Bolsheviks weren't planning to create a dictatorship. It was the civil war which made them do it. Now, as we've seen in today's lesson, even before the civil war had begun, the Bolsheviks were already beginning to develop some of the features of an authoritarian dictatorship. And so you should hopefully now have some evidence that you can add to your table to support hypothesis one. Think in particular about the Sovnikom, which was a key step towards the Bolsheviks dominating government. Think about Sverdlov and the Secretariat and how that was perhaps an early step in the Communist Party becoming bureaucratic. And think also about the creation of Vysenka and how that was an early step in the government taking control of the economy. So I want you to update your table and add these pieces of evidence to your charts. Well done in today's lesson year 12. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. And if you've got stuck on anything today or you have any questions, remember you can drop me an email. I'll look forward to teaching you next lesson where we'll be starting to look at how the Bolsheviks dealt with their opponents in the early months of Bolshevik rule.